it took me seven years to go from this to this. In this video essay, I'll show you how I did that. I'll show you how I made my game, Ballistic Zen. I'll talk about the idea for the game that kept me so motivated, what I learned about game design and art, I'll touch on programming, and I'll generally give you an idea of what it looks like for a game to go from an idea to a finished product. See the links in the description below for all of the sources that I reference, plus the link to the Steam and Itch pages where you can buy the game right now. Buy the game! This is the making of Ballistic Zen. I absolutely love unique and flowy movement systems in games. I don't care about completing levels, I'm more interested in rhythm and smoothness for their own sake. The still undefeated peak of this type of experience, for me, is surfing, the movement mechanic derived from exploiting the physics of game engines like Source. To successfully traverse surf maps, you need to master this swervy, undulating kind of movement. The control scheme is really awkward and relies on strafing in the direction you are turning. When you're learning, it's very difficult, but once you've mastered it, you very quickly enter a flow state that is extremely satisfying. Nothing else is quite like it. I'm always on the lookout for games that have interesting movement systems like this. My first experience with any sort of game development was making levels in the 2D platformer NV 1.4. Following the theme of smooth movement, race levels were my favourite. Once mastered, these levels rewarded you with a very satisfying rollercoaster-like motion of the character. I don't think I'm ever going to be as productive as I was when I was a teenager. I probably made 20 or 30 maps for N. When I figured out I could make surf maps in Counter-Strike Source, well, it was the next logical step. Making 3D maps is much more time consuming, so I only released 5 surf maps in my entire map making career if you can call it that. For both the N and the surf map making communities, I can point to clear influences that led my tastes in a different direction than what the community generally prefers. In N, races are typically linear, but a level called Anyway the N Way by Marij and Andres has four different paths that can be completed in any order. What was remarkable to me at the time was that, despite the variable route, the single chain of flowy movement in the level uh, was never broken. Now, I absolutely loved this, but I don't think the author took the concept far enough. The structure of the level is four loops that each start and end in the same tunnel. The final few maps that I made for N were levels that could be completed in any number of ways with one flowy movement. I really tried to avoid this linear but separated into chunks structure and instead just tried to make a spaghetti. I never had a huge audience for N maps, but these maps were even less popular than my others and I think that's because it was difficult for me to include danger and jeopardy in the spaghetti junction mess. I had a similar interest in surf maps. These days the most popular types of surf maps are linear where the main challenge is completing the map in the first place, and then it's about getting the best time. But my preference has always been the freeform maps designed for combat. Even better than the straightforward combat maps are the ones that allow you to endlessly surf, looping over and over and over again. There aren't a huge amount of surf maps that let you do this, and so that's what I spent most of my time making. Some of my maps copied layouts from other popular surf maps, and some of my maps have their own original layouts. I want to give a quick shout out to a niche sub-community of surfers, the Trick Surfers who are not concerned with going fast, but with finding obscure, difficult routes through maps. And it's not about getting from the start of the map to the end, but from one arbitrary point to another. It's kind of similar to finding lines in skateboarding or parkour, I imagine. Trick surfing isn't my jam because of the effort and finesse required. For me, mastery is about meditation. Not many people played my maps because the audience was just not there. 
I made my maps because they're what I wanted to play and no one else was making them. I've always wanted to share what I love about surfing, but it's so inaccessible. It's difficult to control and so abstract. I often thought it would be great for there to be a standalone surfing video game that anyone could play. A game that gave the experience of surfing without requiring the same obscure skill. I had a small amount of experience making maps and I have a professional programming background, so I thought it couldn't be too hard to make a video game, right? Well, that's hilariously naive. In any case, I had no ideas on what such a game might look like. Enter Perfect Stride. Perfect Stride is an alpha build of a game by the Arcane Kids, who also created Zenith. Members from Arcane Kids have gone on to create games like Donut County and the movement-focused Neon White. I don't remember how I first found Perfect Stride, but as soon as I played it I knew this was exactly the kind of game that I could share with my friends. Perfect Stride has a control scheme and movement style that, even without knowing the history of the game, is unmistakably similar to surfing, with three key factors. Like surfing, turning the mouse smoothly not only adjusts the player's direction, it also gives the player speed. Unlike surfing, ramps or airtime are not required, removing a level of complexity in route planning. Players can go wherever they like. Also unlike surfing, and this is the big one, the player does not need to strafe, i.e. turning the mouse is all the player needs to do to move and gain speed. They don't need to press A or D. There are a few things that I don't like about Perfect Stride. The main thing is that, as a result of removing ramps, players don't have a lot of vertical control, which makes the level, in my opinion, boringly flat. That being said, overall I absolutely love Perfect Stride, and I think it's exactly the right level of complexity to introduce people to the type of movement that I like. But I can't do that because Arcane Kids never finished it. Even finding a copy of the Alpha nowadays is a challenge. See below for a link to my copy. I waited a long time, and at some point I decided, if they aren't going to finish it, I'll make my own perfect stride. Right from the start, I knew exactly what I wanted to achieve. So, here are the explicit goals that I've always had for this project. It probably goes without saying, but I want a movement system that is based on surfing, or more explicitly, perfect stride. I want some element of verticality, and I decided I would include that via wall running. I want the game to be non-linear. The point is not the challenge of finishing, but this meditation and spaghetti junction that I love so much. And finally, I want the movement system and the world to feel grounded. I want players to think of the movement and the world as following consistent rules, as something that could be real, in a sense. I always thought this helped with immersion. From the back of that, I have an extra requirement. I always thought that empty spaces in games were off-putting, and so I decided early on that I would include NPCs to attract people and make them feel attached to the world. So that's basically it. That's what I wanted what I still want to make. The only problem is that I'd never made a video game before. My first task was to recreate Source Engine-like movement. Without a huge amount of thought, I chose to start making the game in Unity, because all the way back in 2015 it felt like the only viable free option. I chose a game engine because I didn't want to be concerned with most low-level engine related things like rendering or file input and output. What next? Well, I found some tutorials, including this explanation of air strafing, and I did a lot of copy and pasting. I don't have a lot of records from this time, but I do have the first build of what I made. I called it Slide. And not only is there basic perfect stride-like movement, but I also implemented some naive wall running and the ability to rewind time. I was so proud. This was my proof of concept, and it was encouraging enough to me that I decided to commit to making a full game. Three years later, this is Hoverblade. 
Unfortunately, I can't remember and don't have recorded most of my decision-making processes, but it's clear from playing Hoverblade what I felt wasn't working from the slide prototype, and also what I just didn't have the skill or ability to do. The movement is, for lack of a better word, compressed. Unlike in Slide, the character gets an automatic speed boost at low speeds to stop this weird feeling of coasting that Perfect Stride has. The maximum speed in Hoverblade, however, has been much reduced, from a basically unlimited speed with a soft cap of about 50 to a pretty hard cap of 15. This is because it's exceedingly difficult to create interesting levels that cater to a wide variation in speed. This speed reduction, one of the first design decisions I made, is also one of the most major decisions that I made in the entire seven years of the project and I often regret it because something of the indescribable surfing feeling is lost at low speeds, but the level design challenge is just too difficult. As for the level itself, well, it's basic. In my mind, at the time, this could have been an alleyway in some future, some sort of topia, but in retrospect, it looks like I've slapped some mirror's edge textures onto some cubes, which to be fair is exactly what I did. The level is linear, and it's difficult to tell where to go, and it's way too difficult. And because progression means climbing, there is a very getting over it-esque sense of complete defeat if you fall down. The only way to get back up is to climb back up. There's too little grounding to this being a real place, and the same could be said of the movement. The game is called Hoverblade, after the eponymous technology that lets players speed around the level, but there's no sign in the game of what a hoverblade actually is. Playing hoverblade can be a frustrating experience. The real success of the project was teaching me how to make a game. I learned how to make 3D levels without using hammer, how to deal with textures, how to do saving and loading, how to make simple UIs, how to make gameplay features like collectibles and races, how to implement sound, how to make character controllers and design movement physics. The important point is that I didn't make Hoverblade with much thought about game design. I was very much directed by learning the basics of game development. I would like to share that I also got some lovely feedback that really kept me motivated. I would never claim this person's experience to be universal. In fact, I suspect that literally no one on the planet would enjoy Hoverblade as much as them. But I gotta tell you, receiving this message makes it all worth it. I created action blocks, small prototype levels that are quick to implement and test. The term is popularised by a talk from a level designer who worked on Titanfall. The idea of making action blocks was to properly nail the feeling of movement and to understand exactly what constitutes a race. Did you catch the assumption that I made there? Nowhere in my goals did I say anything about races, but here they are in action blocks as if they're a vital part of the core game loop. In my first iteration I made seven levels I wanted to see how people reacted to different parts of the movement system. I made a giant flat plane to see if movement by itself was interesting, a sequence of platforms inspired by bunny hopping levels from CSS, a lumpy terrain to see if ramps were interesting, a sequence of platforms of different heights to understand if wall running for shortcuts felt natural, a precision platforming level, a mixed obstacle course focusing on horizontal traversal, and finally a mixed obstacle course focusing on vertical traversal. I couldn't model, and I'm still pretty bad, so I downloaded these arms from the internet and added some cylinders and particle effects. It was incredibly useful to tune how visual and audio feedback correlated to players' actions, even though both feedbacks looked rubbish. Finally, in the first iteration of Action Blocks, I made some minor changes to the control scheme from Slide. My favourite is that I removed the requirement to hold shift in order to be able to wall run. I had always been worried that automatic wall running would be annoying for players, but guess what? Holding down the shift key with your pinky finger for minutes at a time was even more annoying. 
I sent the first build to my friends and pleaded that they play it and give me feedback. I hadn't explicitly asked for feedback in this way for Hoverblade, and no one really played it. But this time, I got about 10 people to start with. Commitment waned over time, and near the end of my action blocks iteration process, only a couple of people continued to offer regular feedback. That being said, all of the feedback I got was incredibly valuable, and I appreciate everyone who took the time to comment on the game. By far the most played level was the clambering level. It seemed to provide the most opportunity for shortcuts and minor mechanical optimizations, and the playtesters were really invested in getting the best time. I was really encouraged that people were enjoying the game, but what I didn't want to see at the time was that they weren't enjoying the game in the way I wanted them to. In any case, there were two major pieces of feedback. One, it was difficult to understand how the movement worked, and two, platforming was extremely difficult. The first was not so much of a surprise, I had hoped that adding the jets would make it clear, but it wasn't enough. One of the key concepts for surfing, perfect stride, and now ballistic zen is that if you turn too quickly, you will lose speed, and that the faster you go, the less room you have to turn before decelerating. Those rules really weren't clear, so in the next iteration, I added this UI. The green bar determines the maximum amount of turn, and the black bar shows you how much you are actually turning. When the black bar is closer to the center than the green bar, you accelerate. When the black bar is further from the center than the green bar, you decelerate. Unfortunately, this still wasn't clear enough. The green bar moving was confusing. It wasn't clear that closeness to the center of the screen was important and it wasn't clear that being inside or outside the green bar were different states. Much later, I made the marker associated with the player's turning display a forwards or backwards arrow to indicate whether the player is accelerating or decelerating, and I replaced the marker associated with the maximum amount of turn with a static background. The maximum amount of turning possible remains dynamic to this day, but this dynamism is hidden from the UI. It's much easier to understand as a player when only one UI element is moving. Regarding the feedback about platforming, well, after some discussion and further iteration, it turned out to be a classic first-person platformer design issue. There are some jumps that seem to be possible, but when tried, the character's feet clip on the edge of the platform and the player falls down. A common solution in games is mantling, but I couldn't figure out how to do that at the time, so I looked at crouch jumping for inspiration. In Ballistic Zen, the player is always crouch jumping, and crouching is tuned so that if the center of your screen is above the platform, you can definitely land that jump. In the Discord, we ended up calling this clambering. It doesn't make much physical sense, but makes the platforming much, much smoother. During the process of iterating over the action blocks, I remained dissatisfied with the approach to slow movement. When beginning movement, the player boosts forward instantly to a medium speed, and they are prevented from going significantly below that by a passive acceleration. I'd like to take a moment to pause and thank again all the people who were involved with the early testing of the game, and I'd also like to thank everybody else who has touched the game in some way, especially the very small active community on Discord. I'm a solo developer in the classic sense of the words, but no man is an island, and the game absolutely would be worse off if not for all of those people, so thank you. During the action block iteration process, two of my close friends expressed an interest in doing some work on the game, so I gave them access to the repository and said, go wild. A small amount of their work made it directly into the final game, including some movement tweaks and jump pads, but the majority of their work was not necessarily aligned with my original goals, and so we didn't include it at all. Nevertheless, I'd like to show you what they worked on anyway, because one, it's really cool, and two, if it wasn't for their continued interest at this point, I doubt I would have ever finished Ballistic Zen. So, this next section is about Paul and Tom. At a high level, Tom worked on procedural level generation and Paul worked on multiplayer and game modes. The following videos are from multiplayer sessions where we tested procedural generation and new game modes at the same time. Tom opted for what I believe is a quite unique approach to procedural generation. Whereas most games use grid-based techniques like wave function collapse, or area noise-based techniques like generating height maps from noise, Tom used a deceptively simple system, 
that create simple geometric shapes using the ProBuilder API offset from each other in a rough line. By tweaking various parameters, Tom was able to generate levels that tended upwards and offered various puzzle-esque climbing challenges that we spent a lot of time enjoying. You uh, you fucking crash into this wall, jump off the media. <laughs> fucking cheer me away. Alex, bested at your own game. I know. Tom progressed from single lines to a random series of points with multiple paths between them. The resulting maps almost without fail offered interesting challenges, and unlike a lot of procedural approaches, there was no obvious repeated patterns between different levels. Although we experimented with colours a little bit, we never explored making the procedural levels feel anything other than abstract. If we ever revisit procedural generation, visuals would be the main area I would focus on because, to be honest, the gameplay was pretty damn good. On Paul's side, in addition to working on the netcode using Mirror, he created a number of game modes including variations of races and reverse tag. Reverse tag in particular gave us some fun moments. Here's me trying to steal a crown from Tom. You can make him work for it. Yeah, the, oh, the no. speed loss should definitely like increase the area that you uh... <gasps> can get the hat stolen from. Tom, you absolute chancer. <gasps> no, I fell! <laughs> Did you die? I fell, yeah. And of course, we answer the age-old question of what would you do if your friend jumped off a cliff? Uh... Oh! <laughs> oh! I could not do it because I did need that crown. <laughs> Just like the rest of development, creating procedural generation and these multiplayer game modes involved a lot of iteration, but it's not the focus of this video. That being said, I'd just like to share this moment that showed us that we hadn't made it clear who has the crown in reverse tag. Come on, oh, that's so annoying! Where are you? Oh, you fucking you gave me the runaround very well. Do you have you, it? No, you boys do realise it's me. Oh, yeah, Jet, Jet oh stole it for God's me. sake, I was just chasing <laughs> Paul all time! <laughs> <laughs> it's a super clear example of where playtesting reveals a flaw in your designs. In this particular case, it was simply a matter of giving that player a different highlight colour. In addition to not aligning with my main goals directly, both procedural generation and multiplayer were too difficult to polish to a level I would have been comfortable with. However, I must say that if I prioritised sales numbers more highly than I do for this project, both these features would have been absolute no-brainers. There's so much more to say about this stuff, but in the interest of time, I'll have to skip it. For now, all I'll say is, Tom and Paul, love you boys. So, to recap. Action blocks iterated, and thanks to friends, motivation at an all-time high. What next? I felt ready to start making, well, the game. Unlike Hoverblade, I wanted it to be a fully polished experience, but I didn't, and still don't, have the skills to achieve everything I wanted myself. I needed to figure out what I could learn to do myself, and what I would need outside help with, and I was willing to pay money to get that outside help. The things I were worried about were all related to art. They were first person arms, world or level style, NPCs, and sounds. The one thing I was absolutely sure I would not be able to achieve myself was the first person view model. I didn't know what I wanted it to look like exactly, and I had never used Blender before, so I thought this was a good place to start with contractors. I found Mike on Reddit, I think, I don't remember exactly, who worked on some concept art with me. I described a character and a vibe, and after some back and forth we came up with Danny. I love how well thought out the whole outfit is in a practical sense. One of the hardest things I've found when working with contractors is getting them to come up with something quote unquote new. It's much easier to say, like this, but different. I really didn't have a lot to go on, especially with regards to the hoverblades themselves, and I'm so grateful to Mike for coming up with what he did. Notice that the colour scheme is very muted. You'll see later that I didn't stick with that. With concept art done, I contacted Brian to create the first person model and animations for me. The animations he created were not exactly what I wanted, but that was my fault because I wasn't able to eloquently describe what I wanted. I originally asked Brian to animate because I was scared of doing it myself, but in the end it was more efficient for me to learn myself, in this case, 
And indeed, the final animations are made by me. I realised literally years after I got this model that Brian didn't include the wraps on the arms. So now it looks like the character will burn their arm every time they use the jets. I also eventually moved away from having a named character, so the wraps would have been nice also to keep the race and gender of the player ambiguous. I tried adding the wraps myself and it was too difficult for me, and by the time I noticed, I was over budget so the unwrapped character remains in the full game. Despite those issues, I love these arms. Thanks, Brian. Where the process of going from idea to concept art to arms was really clear, getting the overall visual style of the game was not nearly as straightforward. I needed to create an environment with these requirements. Lots of flat walls, supports the idea of retro-futuristic or futuristic technology, internally consistent, i.e. feels like a real place, looks attractive, looks unique, which rules out the Mirror's Edge style I had stolen for Hoverblade, and the most important one, perhaps, could be built mostly by me. Let's start by taking a look at the level block out. I made this block out in real-time CSG, which I still recommend as a level prototyping tool for Unity. It's really, really fantastic and I'll link a tutorial that I made related to it in the comments. Because of the flat walls and futurism requirements, I knew the level was going to be in some sort of city. I created this block out with some extremely vague ideas of what the city might end up looking like, but I tried to keep the visuals out of my mind at the block out stage. The tall buildings were made to be landmarks, so I didn't want to have to change the height of the level too much. And I had an idea that the level was mostly rooftops, so I could have a clear reason to respawn players if they fell off the main path, and so I could reduce the amount of detail that I would need to worry about. Apart from these requirements, I was open to pretty much anything. I really had no idea what to do at this point, so I went to Fiverr. I shared the raw model of this level, all of my requirements, and asked for a proof of concept implementation of some kind of environment. I was hoping for some inspiration and a blueprint on how to build the rest of the level myself. The results were mixed. The first contractor used a bunch of assets that you have to pay for, which to start with I don't own, and also it means the game wouldn't look unique. They also got the scale of the objects on the roof completely wrong, but more importantly I think they did a pretty poor job of detailing the roof, which is of course the most important area. The second contractor was so bad it's still hilarious to me. Let's go through the points. First, they took parts of the model I had provided and changed the layout to something different. They didn't even finish their own layout. It's not remotely what I asked for. They definitely didn't use futuristic props or textures, which again, is not what I asked for. But they knew that I had asked for something futuristic because, finally, they included the Millennium Falcon. Just slap the Millennium Falcon on it, that'll make it futuristic. The third and final contractor I used was great. They initially provided me with some of their own concept art. They have a really unique and interesting style. And, as per spec, they provided a 3D model of part of the level, just to give an idea of what it might look like. Unfortunately, there was no way I could match this level of quality if I tried to do the rest myself, so I had to say no to this one. With my current experience, maybe I would make a different decision today, but at the time, it was game over. In the end, I turned to Brutalism, an architectural style made of large geometric shapes without much textural detail. Perfect. Even that wasn't as straightforward as I first thought, but it did reduce the complexity enough for me to make incremental progress. I'll go through all of the iterations I experimented with for this style, which I was doing all the way through the project. The first version I made with textures looked like this. I went for a painterly style because of course, stylized means easier, right? Well, no. A stylized look is just a different type of effort than a realistic look. In the next iteration, I added outlines to help give definition to the simple shapes I was using. In the iteration after that, I took inspiration from the eco-brutalism movement and added trees. Including foliage adds a much needed variation in colour and breaks up the many flat lines. I also switched to grey textures for the concrete, because in the first iterations I was unconfident that it would be clear what I was going for. I added some architectural details like these columns, as well as small windows to further break up the large planes. I opted for small windows after experimenting with large ones and found that I couldn't get them to look good without reflections, which I instantly ruled out on the grounds of complexity. I added red doors as a homage to Mirror's Edge. In retrospect, this was a mixed decision because players get confused about whether the doors are interactable or not, 
If you buy the game after watching this video, no, they're not interactable, but I got attached to them, so they're still there. Well, I switched to purple doors. Red was too obvious. The following iteration was a big one. First, I got fed up with grey. I fought mentally for a while against coloured concrete, but I knew I was going to struggle to differentiate between different game areas in the future, and the grey looks terrible anyway, so I went with brown. I knew I wanted purple for the hover blades and doors, brown for dirt and tree trunks, green for foliage, and blue for the sky, so I used a colour scheme generator and stuck with that rough colour scheme from this point onwards. I added baked lighting and ambient occlusion. In my opinion, this is the single most impactful visual change. Baked lighting is responsible for the smooth lighting gradients on all of these services. It took me a long time to tweak the light map settings to get it to work decently on the huge geometry that I had created, and it would take about two hours to bake. Later, this became way too much for me. Finally, I added vines using a tool called Hedera by Robert Yang. It allows you to paint vines onto geometry, where they can be configured to grow in semi-random directions. Initially, Hedera didn't work with the large geometry I had made, so I submitted a proof-of-concept fix that Robert merged to the main cone base. It makes a big difference visually, and it's super easy to use. Thanks, Robert. In the next iteration, I added thicker lines, thicker fog, and darker textures. I really like this moody look, and I still argue with myself if it's all downhill from here visually. Next, I realised baked lighting was not going to work for the game. As I mentioned, it was taking about two hours to bake, and I needed to tweak the light maps every time I added new geometry. It was killing my productivity, so I removed the baked lighting. It massively sped up my work and was really the right decision, but visually the game suffered, I think. The dark textures just looked drab without the baked lighting, so I experimented here with a nicer colour palette and a different style of outlines to help with understanding depth. Here I reduced the fog and went back to the old style of outlines, just experimenting really. The main improvement in this iteration is screen space ambient occlusion with fading. At the very start of the visual iteration process I had considered and rejected screen space ambient occlusion. Screen space AO, like baked AO, is responsible for the darker areas and corners that give objects depth. Unlike baked AO, screen space is calculated on the fly, every frame, based only on what you can see. This means it's possible for there to be strange visual artefacts. Since the last visual iteration though, I had found Amplify's screen space AO, which is better than the Unity built-in one, which I had tried before, because it includes a distance fade. In other words, it can reduce ambient occlusion at close distances, which massively reduces the appearance of these visual artefacts. In the final visual iteration I will share, I added proper texture detail fading. I struggled for a long time with textures that have an obvious tiling component. The larger the texture scale, the less it looks tiled, but the more pixelated it looks up close. The solution is to have a detail texture that is only visible at close range. This can be handled with MIP maps. I've only shown the major iterations here. I'm confident that all of the visual sacrifices I made were the right ones, but still, it's difficult to feel satisfied. I was making visual changes even as I was writing the script to this video. Getting close to the final visual style of the first area in the game meant that I had figured out my workflow. I could make other areas in the game with a level of confidence that I knew what I was doing and I wouldn't have to go back and make major changes later. I find it much easier to work on mechanics than content, and so for the longest time I put off making more content. That being said, through development I'd figured out that I wanted the game to be split into multiple areas, each with its own gimmick. I didn't do a large amount of planning regarding how much content I would make, I just made what felt right. Here's what I decided to make. An area without a gimmick? an area with towers, an area with one path with variations over three levels, an area that was a puzzle to climb, this one was very lightly inspired by the climbing levels that Tom had made using procedural generation, and finally a semi-hidden area with more difficult challenges and a higher average speed. This one is intended for hardcore players who want to go faster. I imagine the audience is not very large for this one. The first area took me about two years on and off to create. The red and green and blue areas took me about one month each, 
fogged area took me about two weeks to create. The level of content in each area does reflect somewhat the time I put in, which was not my intention. In retrospect, I believe it was a mistake to put off making content for so long, even if creating it earlier would have required me to revisit content as my workflow changed. Having all of this level geometry created doesn't make a game, and while I was iterating over the visual style in these levels, I was also iterating over the core game loops. Despite all of the progress I made during action blocking, there were still two major issues. One, what does the player do in between races, if anything, and two, players were still not always doing the movement correctly. By correctly, I mean moving in these smooth, swooping curves. Already the players would not be able to reach high speeds without moving in this way, but I noticed that even when punished with low speeds, players would still wiggle compulsively, or even not understand at all that turning leads to acceleration. I decided to combat both of these two issues at the same time by introducing some sort of activity to do between races as part of the main game loop. You can read my article on the process in the description below, but to summarise, I went through three major iterations. The first iteration was a combo system, vaguely in the style of a game like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. The idea was that doing jumps and wall runs and maybe hitting specific lines would trigger combos giving you points but to sustain combos, the player would need to turn smoothly. After struggling with what this would look like, I came up with something that I liked. The major issue is that when compared with something like Tony Hawk, there was not any active part of getting points. The system gave incentive to move correctly over moving incorrectly, but after that there was nowhere for the player to go creatively in order to get more or less points in their own way. The second thing I tried was a system I called collectible combos. The idea was that a player would trigger an event from certain locations in the world. Upon triggering, many collectibles would fill the world. Picking up these collectibles would add points and extend a combo. The key piece of design here is that the naive strategy to beeline for all collectibles in the very local area would not be the best strategy because it would get the player in a situation where they could not pick up any more collectibles in time. The best strategy would be to stay on the move and at a certain speed, leaving collectibles behind in favour of moving to areas that are unharvested. Both strategies did successfully cause the results that I wanted, but in playtesting players would just not figure out the correct strategy. The greedy approach was just way too tempting for new players, and so the idea failed as an incentive for new players. It's an interesting mechanic that I would be really interested in exploring in the future. The final system, the one that I stuck with, was the lines system. Perfect Stride had these lines that you had to stay near to to complete. I never wanted them in my game because once lines are complete, there is no way to get them back and because to incentivize all the ways I would want players to move, I would have to just fill the map with these lines, causing a large amount of clutter. But funnily, both these solutions are completely solvable, I just was blind to it. I introduced lines that would appear and disappear randomly, appearing even if they've been completed before. In this way, the player is never finished with lines, and will always have sort of mini tutorials that show them just how to move. There's no reward for doing the lines, they're just there. It's a super simple system, but playtesters liked it, and it does do a good job of teaching new players how to move. Figuring out the percentage progress along a line, which is important for visual feedback, turned out to be a little bit of a challenge. A line is made up of points in 3D space, and those points are not necessarily evenly spaced. This means that each line segment contributes a weighted percentage to overall completion, i.e. two line segments of different lengths contribute different percentages to overall completion. It's also necessary to understand which line segment the player is closest to, which I do by using multiple planes that each bisect two line segments. This solution doesn't support lines that cross over themselves. To make placing lines easier, I made a tool that records the player's movement as a series of points in 3D space and exports that to JSON, and then a tool that accepts this JSON and spawns a line prefab. Using this tool, it took me less than an hour to add lines for each area. Using the colour gradient field of the line renderer didn't give a precise indication of line completeness, so I learnt how to use the Amplify Visual Shade Editor to make a simple texture with a controllable ratio of two colours. And then I felt like getting fancy, so I added an animated vertex offset. Finished with lines, I needed to address the main event, 
races. I needed to know, how does the player trigger races, and what does the overall game progression look like, and how do races fit into that? For example, are races locked and unlocked? Are areas unlocked or unlocked? I always knew that I wanted to have NPCs, so initially I thought about the player initiating races via a dialogue system. I ended up rejecting this idea, because trying to replay a specific race would be difficult to support generally, and it might be annoying to be forced to go through dialogue to do races. NPC dialogue is indeed not the main focus of the game. My first implemented attempt was the graffiti system. I added specific points in the world where the player could trigger specific races and identified them using graffiti. I spent a lot of time making this shader before I was even sure this was the final iteration of races, which turned out to be a mistake when I confirmed that it indeed was not the final iteration of races and I wouldn't need graffiti. Testing the graffiti system with players was also the first time I really tested races themselves in the context of the open world. Although not explicitly said, I felt that the playtesters had a general consensus that races in the main level were not as interesting than the races in the procedural generated levels or the action block races, even though mechanically they were exactly the same. After lots of discussions, I realised that I had not designed the main level for races at all. Instead, I had designed it for the type of play that I liked, all the way back when I was making maps for N and for surfing. Which makes sense! Part of the enjoyment of the procedural levels and the action blocks was repeating the same race but trying to find shortcuts and optimizations. The level I had built, while open on a macro level, did not offer this opportunity for micro optimizations, nor did I really want it to. Separately, I was also unsatisfied that, compared with the lines, the player had to stop their movement and was interrupted to start a race. So, I scrapped races. Instead, I just introduced more lines, lines that were more challenging and could be repeated, and I differentiated them by colour. The difference between a line and a race is that a line explicitly communicates that there can be no root optimization. the challenge is only staying near the line on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, unlike for races, where the routes are a little bit more open. Feedback from playtesting was decent, although there is definitely less general engagement with lines than with races, but that's okay. I introduced a currency as a reward from blue lines and collectibles. Oh yeah, there's collectibles in the game. And I locked off some areas and shortcuts behind the currency. I added what amounts to an end the game button, found at the top of the pyramid. There's no great reveal or end game, and it's not super difficult to get to. It definitely doesn't require completing a majority of the game. It's really just a way of letting players decide when they're done with the game and giving them an opportunity to declare that to the world. I knew I wanted NPCs to move around and comment on various things in the world. I started off using the dialogue system for Unity Asset. It's a really comprehensive asset, but I bounced off it pretty hard because I didn't really get along with the node-based editor. I like node-based editors in general, but for dialogue they seem like more of a hindrance than a help to me. I found the Ink scripting language and implemented a custom front-end to that. It's a really incredible scripting language and very deep, but I found that that depth was very distracting in a game that doesn't need it. One of my primary ideas was to give players various dialogue options, but in a search for simplicity I gave that up and decided the player would be a silent protagonist. This makes the overall structure of a dialogue interaction much more straightforward. I use a giant list of dialogue snippets that are ordered by priority. When the player meets an NPC, the system checks the first snippet. Is the condition met? If yes, show the dialogue. If no, just check the next relevant snippet. And so on and so on. This simple structure meant that it was easy for me to write my own format and save it to disk, which is much easier than writing dialogue inline in code. I started off with JSON, but sometimes I got confused about the start and end of each dialogue snippet, so eventually I moved to CSV, which I much prefer now. In my first solution, NPCs would move around the world based on the player's progression through the game. I've dabbled with writing fiction, but writing narratives for games is much more difficult. It was too much work for me to maintain, so eventually I just let the NPCs move around randomly. I always knew that each NPC would have their own musical theme that plays whenever the player is nearby, and that each NPC would have their own dance. Half inspired by Jet Set Radio Future, and half because music just helps with characterization and makes the audio space of the game seem more interesting. Initially, and for the longest time, I had these floating notes as a way for those playing without sound to find NPCs. 
I couldn't get the notes to fit in with the visual style of the game, so I stole from the greatest game of all time, Outer Wilds, and added this audio waveform that spikes when looking at and near NPCs. It's just a line renderer with randomly adjusting points. It's a really simple solution, and for that reason I find it ultra satisfying. Finding music was a challenge. I considered paying someone, but I didn't have the budget, and I also wasn't sure in the first place what kind of music would fit. I trawled the internet trying to find CC0 music. I wasn't able to find multiple disparate CC0 tracks of the same quality and vibe that were not already used by other media. That is, until I found Dr. Dreamchip's music. Check it out. There's no analysis there, just shout out to Dr. Dreamchip for their music. Thanks! Nearing the end of development, I looked into optimization. They do say that premature optimization is the root of all evil. The game runs well on my computer. Without any reports of poor performance from player testers, and without being able to test it on other hardware myself, I'm really not sure of how much I need to do. As a preventative measure, I added a simple culling strategy where the game only renders the area the player is currently in, and the area the player has their respawn set to. I didn't want to deal with any complicated systems like the built-in Unity one, so my strategy is simply to create trigger volumes that control rendering, and a few choke points that limit visibility so that players don't see things switching on and off. I'll revisit optimization based on the feedback after release. The first thing that I publicly released was called Hoverblade. That name is associated with a trademarked toy, at least two other obscure video games, and fictional technologies in at least two other video games. I don't think any of these reasons legally prevents me from naming my game Hoverblade, but the term is absolutely not googleable. Rather than painfully describe all the logic that went into the final name, Ballistic Zen, I'm going to put on the screen now a pretty comprehensive list of all of the names I considered. Many of these names were suggested by friends on my Discord. Way back when I first made Hoverblade, I hated the name. I chose it because I just wanted to release something and I couldn't think of anything better. By the time I decided that I would need a new name, I was attached, and so were my friends and playtesters. We didn't want to see the name Hoverblade go. I try to use this to remind me that there is no perfect name. It's people's experience with something that gives the name meaning. Anyway, I'm proud to say, here's Ballistic Zen. I've worked on this thing for over seven years. There's so much I didn't have time to talk about in this video. They're things that would be better suited to written articles or videos of their own. I don't want to forget all these other things just because I didn't talk about them, so on the screen is an incomplete list of topics that I considered talking about. There's also loads of stuff that I wish I had done that I didn't have the time or energy or experience to. Maybe I'll revisit them one day. These things include more interactive dialogue, more explicit story, high fidelity third person skating animations, moving NPCs, I mean really moving, like you can see them move, multiplayer, including procedural generation, and more types of content, including races, speed challenges, and so on and so on. So that's my game, Ballistic Zen. If you want to get the game or support me in general, the best way to do that is to buy the game on Steam and then really enjoy it and then write me a positive review. <laughs> the link's in the description. You can also pay what you want, including getting it for free if you check it out on Itch. If you want to support me but don't think you would enjoy the game, I encourage you to buy the game on Itch for a price other than the recommended one. On my itch you can also find some Game Jam games that I made with Tom and Paul, and Paul's commercial game Gun Ugly, which I helped out with. I snuck these in during the development of Ballistic Zen. If you want to stay up to date on future projects, in order of update frequency from highest to lowest, come chat to me on Discord, or follow me on Twitter, or just check in on my website every so often. In the very immediate future I'll pay attention to Ballistic Zen and provide bug and balance fixes when necessary.
After that, I'm going to take a short break. I make this stuff in my spare time, and although I'd love to crank out game after game, I have loads of ideas, it's just not possible with a full-time job. After the break, I will definitely return to game development. I have a couple of ideas at the moment. I've got an idea for a card-based roguelike, and also a PS1-style first-person horror. I'd also like to learn Godot, and I'd also like to work on a team with more shared creative responsibility. These are just my thoughts at the time of recording this video. I might work on something else entirely. I can't imagine Ballistic Zen will get a lot of attention, but if it does, it's unlikely I'll return to it for more content, or multiplayer, because I've just spent too much time with it. But just in case, here's an outrageously high number that I can point to if I get asked about it. If I get 10,000 wishlists on Steam, I'll add multiplayer. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you play the game, I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed making it. Thanks for watching!